Okay, hi everyone and welcome back to Holy Humanist. I am back with the one and only Lloyd de Jong. Lloyd, I said that right, didn't I? De Jong? <laughs> Close. De Jong, yes. Oh my God, see? Oh, okay. By the end of this series, I need to have that nailed. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you so much for being with us. I know we've had a bit of a hiatus again. Um, we've both kind of had a lot going on, but thank you so much for being here. And I'm excited to get stuck into part two. So... Lloyd, yeah, I mean, obviously the ball is in your court. We've got an hour today, ladies and gents, because um, we are running kind of behind on time. So we are mindful. Look, because Lloyd, you're even ahead of me. So I completely get it. Like, it's already yeah. way late in your evening. Um, so we're going to rush through as much as we can today. Obviously, feel free to ask questions on whatever Lloyd is presenting in that moment, if it's related to it. Um, and we'll try and address it in the moment. And if we've got time and Lloyd has certain questions that he does want to address at the end, we'll do that as usual. Otherwise, it can all carry over to the next session. Uh, so, yeah, Lloyd, welcome. And the floor is yours. Well, yeah. So, yeah, good to be back. Yeah, it's, it's holiday season. It's July. So, you know, um, yeah. What was the feedback from the last show? What was the impression people had? Uh, did you hear anything from the audience? Yeah, as in, um, so the comment section is obviously a, a mixed bag, <laughs> as, as expected. Um, a lot of people who are kind of ready to want to accept things for what they are and understand that Islam holistically is comprised of so many different things that like, for me, in my opinion, so in my opinion, if you show even one text that Islamic scholars hold sacred or, you know, sacrosanct, showing that and exposing what's in that is enough to show Islam at face value and the problems with it. I've been getting a bit of backlash because of certain texts that we show, which are so kind of meant for just that, like a tiny sect of people follow or something like that. But then if you try and ask people, what is Islam and what is Islam according to what you think, their answers are all different anyway. And they are following all these different things and they're all getting information from these things. So from my channel and Holy Humanist and what I'm trying to do and the angle I'm coming from is, anything that claims or presents itself to be an authentic Islamic scripture that the scholars agree on, I will present and stand by as, you know, mm -hmm. exposing Islam for what it is. Um, if you start delving into the sects and who agrees with what book and that book only applies to these people, that's not my problem because I'm out of this fold and I can just see it for what it is. Some people believe in that and they call themselves Muslims, therefore that that book is relevant and therefore those rulings are relevant. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of what I wanted to say from some of the feedback that I've been seeing, but did you want to comment on it? Um, yeah, look, we, unfortunately the scholars do lie. Yeah. So many Muslims are misinformed. Many Muslims are not well informed. So they've been, they've been given a, a fairy tale unicorn version of Islam, a very neat, perfect you know, pretty picture, which is not necessarily accurate. And many are not necessarily scholars themselves. And in many cases, they're not necessarily being truthful because they know that beheadings and amputations are legal. They know that wife beating is legal, but they can't say that because it embarrasses Islam. And yeah, we'll, we'll talk about all of those things and uh, we'll show these rulings and we'll make the references available. Anyone can download them. So, yeah. So I just want to make a note now. I, I often get the statement from people because Muslims love and, and others too love to now I'm not a Jew I don't follow the Talmud however I don't have to agree with what's in the Talmud but also when we talk about it we don't lie about it we don't misrepresent it and what I find is that it's 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 become a it's become a sport to lie about the Talmud. Now, we don't have to agree. Now, everyone tells me it's identical to the Sharia. This Matthew Samar has just made this statement as well. Now, yeah. that statement, yeah. now, we can be charitable and state that he's wrong, mm. or we can be uncharitable and state that he's being dishonest, but we, whichever that may be. But when you make the comparison between the two, they are very, very different. Islam has taken the Talmud, has certainly taken these ideas, corrupted them, then made their own version of it. Islam corrupts and inverts everything. Yeah. 
Yeah. And people are going to, and also when I ask people, well, show me the specific laws, because the Talmud is written very differently to the, to the Sharia. There's similarities and there are differences. Mm. Everyone tries to make similarities, but they, the differences are significant. So when people talk about, oh, Jews are allowed to lie, when you go to, so show me those statements, let's go there, because I can do a talk about the Talmud one day. Yeah. And you'll find that this is not the case. Okay. So, so look, I'm not going to get into that discussion now, but, but uh, let me but see. Lloyd, just sorry, in your personal yeah. opinion, real quick, um, would you say that the Talmud is as um, like kind of brutal and violent in its no, punishment not at rulings all. as Sharia, or do you think not at all? Like, no, there's some weird things in the Talmud, but yeah, exactly. but, but not, not at all. Really? Okay. No. Yeah. So like no, he says the Talmud is, is gravely true. hateful against outsiders, and that also is false. Now, this is not to say that Judaism is closed to outsiders, but understand, they will use the most vague statements. They'll take half of one sentence from one paragraph and then present it. I mean, I know this because I've done, I spent months reading the Talmud. I've, I've always discovered I've spent more time researching the subject, reading the Talmud than, than these people that are just simply spewing things out. Now, look, it's very easy to just spew things and it takes a long time to refute them correctly, right? Mm. So, but statements like this are just completely false. And Matthew Samadhi, if not wrong, is just lying. So he needs to pick one. So, okay, so let's move on. Let's, let's just jump into the Sharia. Yeah. And uh, I will share my screen and we'll just jump into that. So let's go back here again. And yeah, so I call this the Muslim Talmud because they are trying to compete with and copy the ideas of the Jews. They want to replace the Jews, replace Christians, replace everybody. Right. Mm. So now the Sharia technically is the revealed law, the explicit specific things stated in the Quran and Hadith. And then you've got the Fiqh, which is the scholars who have now taken these ideas, which are not necessarily ap applicable specifically to situations in the world. And they've now had to use their reasoning to try and create this entire system of laws and politics. So I shall move on from here. Let's continue. So let me get that going. Right, Sharia, sacred or secret? Hmm. Right now, yes, that it is, is sacred, and also, yeah. sorry, that is the question. <laughs> it is a secret because mm. revealing the Tal sorry Talmud, revealing the Sharia is a crime because the Sharia is secret, and to reveal it is the death penalty because it is considered treason. Right, so it's a so, held guarded secret for the top of the top, yeah. Correct, correct. Okay. And we'll be discussing all of that. Now, so Matthew, um, you may not be lying, then you are wrong. You are just wrong, period. So now, this slide is not really relevant, but do understand that when Muslims talk about an Arabic Quran, okay, this is from the book Foreign Words in the Quran by Arthur Jeffrey. This dates to 1938, this printing. Now, there are 50 foreign languages in the Quran. Wow. There are more than 50. Now, you'll notice Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, and Ethiopic are all heavily represented within the Quran. So this is not an Arabic Quran. This is actually a religion that has plagiarized from numerous different outside sources. It's a mixed bag. Even you just look at the top yep. five there. Yeah. And the, the heavy Ethiopic influence, you know, as we were talking yes. about. Southern, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's actually something of interest, but so let's let's move forward from here. So secrets and weaknesses. So so let's start with the sort of the formal presentation from here. This is from the Reliance of the Traveler, which is the most popular, most well-known Islamic Sharia book in the world. This book is very possibly on your neighbor's bookshelf. It's one that he's bought and read. Now, understand that various Islamic governments, Pakistan, Qatar, amongst others, have prioritized the translation of certain books which are considered to be major works in the Islamic world. This was one of the very first Sharia books, if not the first Sharia book, to be translated into English because of its importance. Now that we're discussing it, Muslims will try and say, oh, it's not important. Oh, it's a 14th century book. Oh, it was only followed by one guy who lived in 1292 on a street corner in Cairo, but he's dead now and no one reads it. Yeah. OK, yeah. but so but that is absolutely not true, because this is the most well endorsed Islamic law book in the world. It's endorsed by, amongst others, Al-Azhar as being 100 percent fully compliant with Islamic, with Sunni Islamic law. It is fully Sunni Islamic. 
And then also it is endorsed by numerous other Islamic organizations as being completely authentic. And so if a Quran is being purchased for someone, it is obligatory that the person be Muslim. The same is true of books of Hadith and books containing the words and deeds of the early Muslims. So it is obligatory that the person be Muslim, right? If they read the Quran. Now, Quran in this context means any work that contains some of the Quran, even a slight amount. This ruling holds for any religious books, even the tabakat of Shara'ani. Now, this tabakat is a series of biographical sketches of Muslims. It discusses famous Muslim scholars through the ages. Mm -hmm. Now, the cat's out of the bag. Unfortunately, the internet and so on, we have access to the sources, but this is the law. Well, and also, Lloyd, I was just thinking, like, the first description as well. I mean, surely if you really kind of knew what you believed in was true and correct and all that, you wouldn't want the only pa people purchasing the Qurans to be Muslims, right? You'd want to spread that as far and wide and be like, that's the way we can spread our religion, people reading the book and then, you know, feeling what you're meant to feel and believing it and it's the truth and it's the word of God yes, and it's divinely inspired, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> but but it's meant to be interpreted through a scholar. You're meant to learn it from a scholar, not through your own reading. Exactly, of course, because what happens is when you read it on your own volition, you end up leaving Islam because you you read it at face value and you realize it for what it is, especially even when you, more than just reading it, digging into the tafsirs even and seeing like, you know, the detail behind it, mo more often than not makes it worse. But just from what you've shown me in, in terms of the fact that the person has to be a Muslim and all of that, like, this uh, immediately to me when I see this slide is just lending itself towards when you ask the question, sacred or secret, this is completely implying secret and secrecy to me. Correct. And there's, yeah, there'll be other rulings as we go through, we'll show how this ties into other rulings. Right. Right. But understand, for instance, it says here, this is a chapter called Holding One's Tongue, section R8.0, within the Reliance of the Traveler, which has thousands of laws about everything from zakat, to purification, to prayer, to how to pray in the mosque, how to lead the prayer, the kinds of prayer, the words of the prayer. Now understand that this, this has 26 different chapters and they cover everything in the life of a Muslim, from how to walk into the toilet, which foot goes first, what yeah. prayer you have to say. Yeah. Now, now all of these things we know are practices that Muslims follow mm. and thus they are accurate, accurately representing what Islam is. And then of course, this also happens to have things which are very embarrassing for Muslims. Yes. And then they want to claim the book is false. But if 99% of this book is accurate, then why is the rest false? What's exactly. wrong with the rest? Exactly. Right. Now notice it says they, might, they may not give directions to wrongdoers. And doing that includes showing the way to policemen and tyrants when they're going to commit injustice and corruption. Now yeah, think According France, to Muslims. Islam. Yes, yes, Islam, exactly. So think of the Bataclan. Think of the massacre that happened there. These men hid for three months in Molenbeek and they weren't hiding. They were walking around. They were protected by the community who did not speak because the policemen who were looking for these men who had committed no crime. Remember, they'd killed people that, according to Islamic law, deserved to be killed. And we can look into those laws in the future. But understand, these policemen would be going to commit corruption. Therefore, they should not speak to the police. Mm, exactly. Right. And also, Muslims may not teach questions of sacred law to those learning it in bad faith, who do not want the knowledge to apply it in their lives, but for an unworthy purpose. So we are learning this for an unworthy purpose. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's an arbitrary measure of that in the first place. But yeah, again, Lloyd, pure secrecy here. We're not even meant to be privy to this, is yes. what that's implying. Yeah. So there's this hierarchy. There's this hierarchy of knowledge and it starts at the top and there's this pyramid and it works its way down. So they're not to teach sacred law to those learning it in bad faith, to deconstruct it. So you're not allowed to learn it unless you want to become a Muslim or a better Muslim. Yeah. Right. You can't but, use this in bad faith to go against them, basically. And also correct. they're only going to let you in to the deepest depths of this if you are one of them. Otherwise, this is completely concealed from you. Correct. Correct. So now there's this idea of the makasid al sharia, the aims or the purposes of the law. So in legal theory, it's the idea that the sharia is a system that encompasses aims or purpose, purposes, not merely a collection of inscrutable rulings. Now the term inscrutable, this is, you know, things that are hidden, things that are not known, things that are hard to see, 
mm. understand already the, the implication within the encyclopedia of islam here is that these are inscrutable no one knows what's going on yeah but it's, more and it's more you show me this is, is the encyclopedia of islam it seems to be like these words and the, the choice of them the jargon is so well thought out because it, it speaks volumes as you said like the connotations of the words found in the encyclopedia just lends itself more towards this whole theory of like this this very mystical supremacist hierarchy that's kind of covert from the rest of the world yeah yeah correct can i make one deviation i, I want sure. to do something sure. i want this to step out of something for a moment yeah on the point of this whole jewish thing Okay, I've discussed this well in the past. There's this talk by this guy, Owen Benjamin, who goes off on a crazy rant. And he says, yeah, about, he says, if you think that they have to tell the truth, you have to understand that in Talmud, they say, let me quote it. Jews may use lies to circumvent a Gentile. That's in Baba Kama 113a. That's by Owen Benjamin in this video. And yeah. I can play the video, but I mean, take my word for it for now. Otherwise, follow the link and look at it yourself. Now, this is the section of the Talmud that I'm going to show now. Rabbi Hanina, so the Gemara answers, now the, the Talmud is structured completely differently to the Sharia. The Sharia is a legal text. Yeah. The Talmud is structured in what they call pilpul, peppering, which is basically a debate, right? Mm -hmm. Or questions or tests for people to, so here's a legal, here's a legal question, here's a legal problem, what's your reply? What's your opinion? Right. What's your opinion? And it goes through a list of legal opinions. Not necessarily even a law or a ruling comes out of this. It's simply a discussion of the rabbis to say, what do you think? And then someone will play devil's advocate, throw in an opinion saying, okay, we can eat babies. What do you guys think? And then the guy said, no, no, you can't. Like now you say, yes, you can, seminar, because, and then like, no, you can't. Yeah, Sorry? it's more like a Socratic seminar type discussion. Correct. Yeah. Now he says here, the Mishnah is discussing a customs collector who does not have a limitation placed by the governor on the amount he may collect. And he collects as he pleases. Then this, the other sage of the school of Rabbi Yana said, the mission is discussing a customs collector who stands on his own. He was not appointed by the government, but on his own. And he forces people to give him money. Mm -hmm. Now, any of these people, including this guy that was in the comment, this idiot in the comment section, excuse my French, did he come and tell us, oh, by the way, the Talmud says that it's not about directly lying, but it's discussing a customs collector who is stealing from people. Yeah. I, I don't recall that anyone actually spent the time to clarify that the, 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 the Talmud very explicitly says we're talking about a customs collector. And the question is, when the guy comes to you and says, you owe me $5 million, you go, I don't have the money. Can you lie to him because he's cheating and lying and stealing? Or should you be honest because he's working for the law? What do you do? Understand, this is, a, this is an ethical question that's being discussed. Mm. So now notice, I'll continue. Okay, one may vow before murderers, plunderers, and customs collectors in order to reinforce the claim that a certain item that is being commandeered is teruma, that it belongs to the king's house, or that it doesn't belong to you, or so on. So they're saying, well, there are laws that say this. And then another guy also, well, there are laws that say that. Can it be that it is permitted to pronounce such a vow before customs collectors? But then doesn't Shmuel say the law of the kingdom is the law? It should therefore be prohibited to state such a vow before the customs collectors. In other words, don't lie to them even if they are lying to you because it's against the law. I don't recall that the guy in the chat actually made this clear that, that the scholars actually turn around and say, no, 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 you shouldn't lie. Hold on, let's continue. I'm just going to go to the bottom. I'm just going to just finish this quickly without, without going through the full context of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, they confirm the dispute is with regard to a customs collector who stands on his own, who is self-appointed. This guy just started taking money from people saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a tax collector. Give me money. And he says here, now, the Mishnah issues its ruling with regard to a Gentile customs collector, whom one may deceive, as it, as it is taught in the Baraita. Right? So now they're saying, okay, well, what about this rule? In the case of a Jew and a Gentile who approach the court for judgment in a legal dispute, if you can vindicate the Jew under Jewish law, vindicate the Jew. And then say to the Gentile, this is our law. Okay, fine. Yeah. But now it goes on. If you can be vindicated under Gentile law, vindicate the Jew and say to the Gentile, this is your law. And if it is not possible to vindicate him under either system of law, you approach the case circuitously. You try to, you know, play with the law, right? Seeking a justification to vindicate the Jew. But notice, this is not a law. It is not a ruling. This is the statement or the opinion of Rabbi Yishmael. That's the statement, the opinion of one scholar on the basis of this legal question. Then this is the main scholar. This is like... This is like the top guy steps in and he lays down the law and he says, Rabbi Akiva disagrees. And he says, 
one does not approach the case circuitously in order to vindicate the Jew due to the sanctification of God's name, as God's name will be desecrated if the Jewish judge employs dishonest means. Okay. Is that clear? Mm-hmm. So understand, this. these are a handful of paragraphs from probably 50 paragraphs. So some guy takes one sentence or a portion, a portion, okay? So, so with regard to a gen- whom, so this guy takes 10 words out of a thousand and goes, there it is. Yeah. Do you understand the problem with this? Yes. But that's exactly what Muslims do with the Quran. They'll take that one line out and you're like, yeah. read the line above and read the line below. It completely distorts yeah. the message you're trying to promote. Correct. So understand. And it goes on. Okay. We should not attempt to circumvent him, circumvent on account of the sanctification of God's name. Understand. So there's, so this gets complicated. Whereas if we go to Islamic law, let's go have a look at Islamic law. So this is the reliance of the travel again. And they have a chapter called, can you read the highlighted portions for me, please? Yeah, sure. Lying, permissible lying, in circumventing those forbidding the permissible, obligatory lying, giving a misleading impression. And they teach you how to do all of this because this is not only legal, but obligatory to lie. There's a whole chapter on this. I mean, for a spiritual religion of peace, you wouldn't think you'd find a chapter called obligatory lying in there, would you, Lloyd? So, yeah, if it teaches obligatory lying, it may not be the religion of truth. It It might not be the deen of peace. Right. So what we're going to be discussing as we go through the series is what Sharia is in relationship to the Quran and the Sunnah, where it is found, the books it's found in. Anyone can download them. Anyone can read them because they've been translated as a matter of priority for Islamic scholars. Detail its terminology and rulings, define its role. We're looking at Islam's major doctrines, address misconceptions in it, right? Look at Islam's divisions, its levels and authority structure. And we'll examine how, when, where, and why the Sharia was created. Mm-hmm. We'll trace its historical and political development. Then we will also compare briefly with the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, which we've just done. Oh, okay. For example. Oh, yeah. Right. So the Talmud, I'm not saying like I'm, I'm not calling the Talmud a holy document, but understand yeah. people are lying about it. As our friend was earlier, mm-hmm. they'll simply steal a few words and say, here, here you go. That is that is false. Right. So I'm not saying the Talmud is all all unicorns and rainbows, but when we present it, we shouldn't lie about it. Yeah. And we'll, the Sharia is the fi- is the final product. It is the end goal. It's the the Quran and the Sunnah are raw ingredients. The Sharia is the final product of Islam. Yeah. Right. It's that cake it, that you were talking, the metaphor you were talking about last time. Yes. Yeah. And it must be imposed by persuasion or by force. Right. <laughs> two, so two submit, very yeah. peaceful things. Well, <laughs> may we add. <laughs> Persuasion and force. (laughs) Yes. So I'm going to be using a number of academic sources. This is a very famous paper from a very well-known scholar on the subject, Islamic and Talmudic Jurisprudence, the Four Roots of Islamic Law and their Talmudic Counterparts. So this is plagiarized from from the Jews, basically. But Mm -hmm. they've also plagiarized from other sources, not just that. Mm -hmm. Then this guy's a little bit of an apologist for Islam. Was al-Shafi the master architect of Islamic jurisprudence? Wild Halak. Good paper, but he's a little bit of a sign of an apologist, so he tends to slant, he tends to whitewash Islam a little bit. Right. In reliance of the traveler, this book, everyone should read this book, <laughs> the, the Hedaya, which is very complex but really good. Uh, let me show you the Hedaya while we are here. Oh. So, the Hedaya is 2000, nearly 2700 pages, it is wow. very detailed. And when it's four volumes, and when Imams go to seminary for five, four, five, seven years, whatever they do to qualify as a judge or a sheikh to give fatwas or a qadi to work in a court. The hedaya is often the final manual they study due to its complexity and detail. Wow, okay. Now, this is a chapter, okay, of the hedaya. Now, this was translated in 1791. And notice of thefts which occasion amputation. And then on the manner of cutting off the limb of a thief. Now, we've got... Let's see how... You've got a number of pages yeah. describing exactly how this happens. Then, of course, because Islam is a religion of peace, you can see here on the manner of waging war. Waging war. For the and then, 
This is Muhammad's forte. Please read it. <laughs> and of plunder and the division thereof. Now, I believe that pirates would make plunder and then divide the plunder. That's what pirates did. But apparently this is a holy act. It's a religious it's thing. It's a holy act, exactly. And apparently an even holier act is that Muhammad gets about 70 of or more percent of the divisions, by the way. Of the 20% wars. or whatever of everything, yeah. Yeah, a lot so. of it goes to him. I mean, I don't know the exact figure, but, but he gets the spoils before it gets divided amongst yeah. his companions. And you can see here, okay, yeah. So if you steal property to the value of 10 dirhams, the law wards amputation of his hand. Okay? Because yeah. Allah said in the Quran, if a man or woman steal, cut off their hands. And there's, there's several pages which talk about how to cut off the hand. So understand, this is Islam. And if we don't want this to become the law of the land, we must oppose Islamic law. Yes, exactly. That's why, I mean, I always say Sharia is part of the extremist threat. It's not a solution. I mean, in the UK, what I'm seeing now more and more is that we've got this kind of parallel system developing where we've got obviously like, you know, British like civil law in place, but we've got an entire system where pockets and masses of people in certain cities are going to Sharia tribunals and relying on Islamic law and literally governing their lives by that. So even a woman, for example, who's been granted a civil divorce by the UK courts does not consider herself divorced because the Sharia council here is refusing to give her that very same divorce, even though in the law of the land where she is, she's, she's divorced. Um, yeah. But that's the hold that this, and, and also it's just so funny because you can go to civil courts and get yourself completely freed, but it's the Sharia court that is the one that's keeping you chained. And even the whole concept of divorce in Islam being a unilateral thing for men gives them the element of that control. Um, there's so many, well, it obviously gets darker and deeper as you go into it because they gave women an out by applying for something called a khulla in, through courts. But in order to apply for that, you have to forego your meher, which is the payment that your husband gives you on oh, marriage. Yes. And a lot of these situations that I'm seeing in the UK is when the husband hasn't even paid the entire meher to his wife. And when she eventually goes to ask for a divorce, having got and secured a civil one, she goes to the Sharia council to get um, the Islamic one. But they say, because you haven't been paid your meher, you can therefore not be divorced Islamically because you don't fulfill the condition, which is ridiculous. But um, that's also giving men that element of control because they have that right unilaterally. And then they don't fulfill the condition that they're required to. You can essentially hold a woman in limbo for, a, a, you know, an indefinite period of time. And this is um, in Western countries. Exactly. Exactly. Lloyd. This, this violates the law. Exactly. And it's just happening everywhere. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that they are following some kind of legal system. But if you look in the Quran, you're not going to find those laws. No. Exactly. It's not in and there. Even the so, Quran, yeah. you won't find the concept of a khulla, which is when a woman decides to um, get a divorce herself. You, that, that's something that countries had to work and progress towards. Tunisia was one of the first to do it. Pakistan also like jumped on the bandwagon, but it's still very problematic for a Muslim women to get divorces. Right. Sorry, but yeah, go yeah. ahead. It's cool. Yeah. So we're going to have um, a number of different sources that we will be going through. And of course, links made available for everyone to download and look at them for themselves. Examine my sources. The Brill Encyclopedia of Islam, to buy this will cost you about $40,000, $45,000. To rent it will cost you about $5,000 a year. Okay? And yeah, it's expensive. This is the gold standard in, us, in Islamic studies. It's written by hundreds of scholars. It's been updated now for more than a century. And um, it's it's con every quarter new updates come out. And it's written by Muslim scholars, Western scholars, you name it. It's, and uh, it's fascinating what's in this book. It's incredible, the information that's in here. The Brill Encyclopedia of the Quran, which is a much newer, six volumes. Yeah. This is like three and a half thousand pages. This, yeah. this is like 15,000 pages. Uh, we'll use the Digest of Muhammad and Law. And also, this is supposedly the most read Islamic text after the Quran itself, the Ikhya Ulam al Din. Mm. By Sheikh. Al Islam Al Ghazali or the Hujat Al Islam Al Ghazali. Wow. Yeah. So, Al Ghazali himself. Yes. Yes. Now, do we follow the same religions if you're a Christian versus Jew versus Islam? Because Islam claims it's the same deen. Now, here's an interesting question you can ask any Muslim. Okay, so if it's the same God, 
so say the Shahada in the name of Yahweh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Muslim, if you said that to a Muslim, they would absolutely go crazy. Yep. So <laughs> slaughter your animal for Eid in the name of Yahweh. <laughs> Oh right God. say the bismillah to yahweh it's not going to happen if it's the same god what's where's the problem yeah yeah i was just trying to do that in my head as you said say the shahada to yahweh i was like a shadua sh yahweh because <laughs> it's just so hard to place like replace the name in my head and then i was thinking about the bismillah rahman rahim yeah you have to go bismillah yeshua yeah it's, it's just, so yeah. ask them to do it and they'll know because that is not the name of Allah. That's a different yeah, God. And they, in their head, at some some level, Lloyd, that even though it's a monotheistic God, and according to them, that was a true, you know, a true message at some point, in your head, I mean, even as an ex-Muslim, that's still shirk in my head to me. Do you know what I mean? Putting anyone's name there but Allah seems a bit shirky. Yeah, they won't do it. Yeah. So, so in a sense, they, they are immediately problems to be found but yeah let's continue so quran forty two thirteen, allah has laid down for you the same deen or way of life and belief what well, political system which he had commanded to noah and which we have enjoined or in, in enjoined as an injunction a legal injunction a legal command upon you and which we have bequeathed to abraham moses and jesus so that they should establish the religion which is islam and not be divided amongst themselves obviously here's the claim that all of these foregoing prophets of the bible were muslims Mm -hmm. It is obligatory. Like Four thousand, apparently, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and of course, they they must have gotten shorter over time because remember, with Adam, they started at about thirty something meters tall, and now we ended up today. <laughs> and of course, Adam is buried next to the Kaaba. So where is his thirty meter long skeleton next to, <gasps> along with three hundred buried prophets? Yeah, exactly. Which apparently went everywhere to every land and spoke in those people's languages. So from the Amazon to the Aborigines, where are their prophets? And they're buried next to the Kaaba, 300 of them. And okay, fine. Just Come dig them up, up, please. Let us dig. Yeah. <laughs> so now, according to Al-Shara'ani, we saw him earlier, the Tabakat of Shara'ani, and he's a very important figure in the development of the Sharia. It is obligatory to act according to the Sharia of the Prophet of Muhammad and to abstain from that which was abrogated from the Sharia of Jesus. Oh. So they believe that, that the, the Sharia, the law of Jesus was abrogated Understand? So Muslims are always trying to tell, will tell Christians, you are lawless because you don't follow the law. The problem is that Islam is a religion of law. It has a full legal system. Judaism, at least old Judaism, was a religion or is a religion of law. But of course, if you go to Israel, they're not following the law of Moses. They're maybe in a religious sense, maybe in a ceremonial sense, but not in a legal sense. They have a secular legal system. You look at Western countries, they have secular legal systems. Correct. Christianity is not a religion of law. It has purely the ceremonial law, yeah. right? So, or moral law. But mm. this is not law that is binding in a secular term, in a civil sense. So mm -hmm. there's no civil law. Islam has civil law. And in fact, Islam makes no distinction between civil law, ceremonial law, and moral law. And, the and same. Lloyd, I think this, yes. this point that you just mentioned is the point that needs to be hammered home because this shows you how, you know, like these countries that obviously with former Christian countries have managed to embrace like enlightenment values and secularist values and kind of come to where they are now. And we see that the fruition of that, but in, a, in, in countries that we see that are battling, they're trying to progress, but they just carry on taking steps backwards. Countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, all of these countries that are trying to hold on to their Islamic identity and what that means in a like governmental legislative sense is that you have to employ Sharia at some level, right? To kind of thump your chest because otherwise, where is it all gone? What's the whole purpose of Islam? Sharia is integral. Um, it's only the countries that we see that are kind of allowing Sharia to become more and more kind of just BTEC, take like backseat roles when it comes to like legislation and, and, you know, punishment and all of that, that they are actually progressing. Otherwise you are stuck in a constant battle between very, very archaic, stringent, both civil and criminal mm. laws uh, in a world which is just moving towards modernity and progression. Yeah. And you'll always be at the bottom of the barrel. Yet, like, I mean, you know, like countries like Pakistan, we have prime ministers like Imran Khan who are hell bent on maintaining that identity, which includes part and parcel Sharia law in that, 
at some level or anyway what sharia implies in terms of a very conservative society and then you constantly are battling with secularism and enlightenment values because sharia fundamentally contradicts that um so it's insanely yeah. problematic and i think that's a very 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 good point that you brought up is in christianity has laws but it's more of a moral set of laws that doesn't trickle down into the civil sphere or if it ever did that was kind of cut out and managed to be separated well it informs like your morality informs your legal system this is normal yeah true exactly. right we don't chop off hands we don't chop off yes. heads yeah right we don't stone people to death because your morality yeah. doesn't inform your legal system so that morality informs the legal system whereas clearly islamic morality informs its legal system yeah so exactly so now, there's a small caveat, and this is from Judith Romney Wagner, who wrote Islam and Talmudic Jurisprudence. Severe limitations are imposed by the scarcity of early Islamic legal material and the complete lack of pre-Islamic Arabian legal texts. What is interesting is that prior to Islam, Islam was awash in language and writing. The previous inhabitants prior to Muhammad were all literate. They were wealthy traders, and there were at least seven languages that were common in Arabia from the Greek to the Latin to the Aramaic and so on and so on and so on. And then all of this material just disappeared under Muhammad until 200 years later. Yeah, well, I, we have brought that up before, that it, it's interesting yeah. how, you know, the, this claim that he was unlettered and illiterate and stuff when people around him seem to, seem to be absolutely very well read and being able to kind of the poetry mm -hmm. was, was immaculate back then. Like that was how they, that, that was the thing in their culture that, you know, poetry was was orally transmitted, it was huge, people memorized it, they sang, they recited it in almost like spoken poetry, very similar to how we see recitations of the Quran that people claim are so beautiful to the ear. Mm. That is a literally a copy paste of how Bedouin Arab poets at that time would recite mm -hmm. poetry. There's nothing Correct. marvelous about that. <laughs> people were even yep. challenging Muhammad in his time by reciting poetry and he had them all killed. Um, so yeah. Right. So research is further hampered by the probability that doctrinal considerations, which were basically doctrinal beliefs about Islam, led to the expunging of any references to foreign sources from the early legal texts. Now, I've been trying to work to sort of source some of these things, and we have, as we spoke about in monotheism. But yeah, so now you've got Arab legal culture moving to the Talmud. So Islamic law developed beyond region-specific Arab customary laws in the 8th and 9th centuries in their wars as they wars of conquest mm -hmm. right and they started with the jurisprudential bases of the babylonian talmud especially when they went to iraq this is where the jews were well established there were numerous seminaries and they started incorporating those ideas so jewish and islamic law are theocratic legal systems okay resting on the concept of a divine law revealed to a prophet in a scripture yeah the jews that is the torah now the torah is the first five books of the old testament now the Quran very specifically speaks of the Torah. You'll find this in the Torah, but they'll then happily go to any and every other book in the Bible when the Quran specifically refers to the Torah, right? They'll go to the old, anywhere in the Old Testament, you know, outside of that specific reference to the Torah. Yeah. And for Muslims, the Quran. So rabbinic law developed during the first five centuries AD, culminating the editing of the Talmud in the sixth century. Now, it distinguishes civil, moral, and ceremonial law. Jewish law has evolved. Jewish law today, no one follows that. No one does any stoning. No one has for 2,000 years, right? So that law of Moses, many of those laws were never enacted. Mm -hmm. Many of those laws might have been on the books, but never enacted. And, and also Jewish law. Is this because of the distinguishing between the, the different elements? Yes, but also if you read other Jewish texts, if you read some, like in the Pirkei Avo, right? They speak of that mankind must evolve towards justice. Mm. So we have to move away from barbarity and wow. move towards rationality and justice. Okay. So you don't do stoning because that is barbaric and we must find better ways. This is part of the Jewish thinking. Whereas and, this is not part of the Islamic. As sacrosanct as the Talmud or like, does it kind of, you know, like, is it like the Quranic abrogation? If we were to take that, like, well, why are they thinking that that holds more weight? The fact that we should work. Because the Talmud that? is not necessarily a book of law. It's a, it's a discussion about the law. Right. Okay. Yeah. More that back and forth Socratic philosophic discussion, and then yeah. the top of the the top dog comes and gives his ruling on it. Yeah. Yeah. And also, many times the discussions lead nowhere; they just end abruptly. Oh wow. Okay. Wow. They'll be talking about horses, then suddenly they'll be talking about selling baskets, and then they'll be talking about pregnant women, yeah. and then going back to pregnant cows, and then they'll <laughs> talk about cartwheels that are too big. Wow. 
but it's not it's like this it, so it's just kind of random sometimes mm. okay now islamic law developed during the 7th to 9th centuries the main foundation was laid then culminating in the classical theory of islamic jurisprudence now it does not separate mosque and state it only finished full development in the 14th or 15th centuries yeah so Islamic law took roughly 800 years to 900 years to develop. It did not happen overnight. And right? that in itself should ring an alarm bell, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the thing is, any political, legal system, moral system takes a long time to develop. You don't have a good idea today and then everyone goes, hey, let's all do that. No. Ideas take a long time to entrench themselves in the culture. If you had a better way to, I don't know, do something... Not, not everyone's going to agree with you. Not everyone's going to, going to want to hear about it. You're going to have to force it on people's throats sometimes. Yeah, right. to get them on board. So yeah, it takes work. Yeah, takes takes hundreds of years in a, in a culture. So now there are strong Talmudic parallels with the legal theory of Imam Shafi. This is the guy from the Shafi school of fiqh. He's mm -hmm. the guy that kind of, he's the main hunter behind the development of the Sharia. He's, mm, okay. okay, so there's a borrowing of fundamental concepts from the Talmud Bavli or the Babylonian yeah. Talmud. And this is quite yeah. uh, a, an accepted fact, right? That like a lot, like some of the basics of Sharia have been extracted from the Talmud, some of yeah. the Talmud anyway. Uh, that's why I asked you earlier what your thoughts were if you were had to combine like at face value the Talmudic or the Mosaic laws vis-a-vis -vis Sharia laws. But uh, yeah, this is, this is, I mean, I, I'm waiting for this because I, even in the Talmud, you find these prescriptions for stoning and stuff. Obviously, as you said, like that law has evolved and, you know, they've managed to like aim towards justice and things away from the barbarity. But those kinds of barbarity are exactly what we find in the Sharia today, which are timeless and eternal and apply forever. So it has to have come from somewhere. And this is what was there's a lot of interactions between Muhammad and the Jews anyway, which we find. Yes. And they are depicted in the Hadith. They are recounted in the Hadith. I mean, all over the place. And you'd find actually a lot of places where he's seeing what they're doing and he's seeing their practices play out and he's doing the complete opposite a lot of the times as well. So, so, yeah. so given the scarcity of legal provisions in the Quran itself, the Quran doesn't have a lot. It's, I mean, Muhammad is mentioned, what, four times? Jesus is mentioned like 90 times? <laughs> is it a book about Jesus? Honestly. <laughs> you know, one has to wonder, right? Yeah. So now the Quran is, was not intended to be a comprehensive law code. So it was inevitable that they needed to develop a legal system, especially as they became an empire. And once we start talking about Dawah, you'll see that Dawah is about building an empire, mm. right? So now the Mujtahid Mutlaq Shafi, this word is very important. We'll get into that. But okay. Imam Shafi says the Quran texts are couched in very general terms, which it is the function of the Sunnah to expand and elucidate. To make Allah's meaning absolutely clear. So the Quran itself, according to the major scholar Imam Shafi, one of the founders of the schools of Fiqh, and he's a mujtahid mutlaq, an absolute scholar. The mutlaq means absolute. He cannot make a mistake. Oh wow. His and rulings he's are saying the Quran is vague. <laughs> and there are four absolute scholars, the founders of the four schools of Fiqh, the four schools mm. of jurisprudence. Mm. Right. Now they're saying that the Quran needs the Sunnah to explain it. Yeah. But once they've got that, then they had to well. We'll, we'll get through. We'll work our way through that. Now, Christianity is abrogated according to Islam. It's been replaced, as is Judaism and every other religion. Mm -hmm. So this section has been translated, this is in the Reliance of the Traveler, to clarify possible confusions among Muslims as to Islam's place amongst world religions. It is very supremacist, you'll see. Previously revealed religions were valid in their own eras as attested by the Quran, but they were abrogated by the universal message of Islam, as is equally attested in the Quran. Now, this is, these are points that are worthy of attention from English-speaking Muslims who are occasionally exposed to erroneous theories, stating that all religions are equal because they, they see these theories that affirm these religions' validity, but they deny or do not mention their abrogation, or that it is unbelief kufr to hold that the remnant cults now bearing the names of formerly valid religions, <laughs> such as Christianity and Judaism, are acceptable to Allah after he sent Muhammad. To oh the entire God. world, Lloyd. This, this is, is yeah. telling you all how wrong you are. You are so so wrong. Everything was valid once, but now this is just ridiculous. After the final messenger has Islam has come. Yes, Islam yes. has come. How do you not know that everything before it is yeah. a complete lie, corruption, fabrication? Mohammedan way is the only way. 
Yeah. Uh, the, there's a bunch of bickering ghouls in the comments section. If they could focus on the topic, maybe let's all talk about the Sharia. So, and notice they state here, they, they refer again to the Ijma. This comes up a lot, the consensus, the, the agreement between the scholars. Yeah. This is a matter of which there is no disagreement among Islamic scholars. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, right. that's not surprising at all. Yeah. Right. And if there are questions about it, a Muslim should should um, go to an imam who will give him a scholarly Quranic ex exegesis, a tafsir. So the imam will explain the tafsir to the Muslim. And finally, Islam is the final religion that Allah will never lessen or abrogate until the last day. So this is the official position of Islam on its place amongst religions and that everything else. Now, understand, this is this also tells us that these interfaith dialogues will fail. This is that there is no hope for him because you see Islam regards every other religion. So Islam is the okay. Islam is the Deen ul Haq. Okay, you'll find a billion different spellings of this, so really it doesn't matter. Whereas all other religions are the Deen al Batil. Batil means worthless, void, vain, basically useless. Okay, Batil also happens to be one of the names of Satan. So all other religions are worthless, void, but also the religions of Satan. Wow. <laughs> Whereas Ulhaq is the truth, the ultimate reality, mm. the gnosis, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And that right. makes sense. You know, just even when, when you wrote it there, I knew that the polar opposite of what they would call everybody else would be just the extreme. Because if you call it, if you're the, if your religion is the Haq, that is the truth. You are claiming, you know, the truth of the entire world, reality, existence, everything. Um, but also number three is exactly what Muhammad or, you know, whoever came and kind of like consolidated, consolidated this whole theology after him has completely done this to obviously make Christianity, Judaism, all the forebearers of the Abrahamic faiths, like, like if you delegitimize them and then you make Islam the finality, that gives Islam insane amounts of legitimacy and that's what they had to do like in in a in a vow for conquest and going further and giving themselves a name to stand by because even before that these arab tribesmen were not really anything in the grand scheme of things they had to put this entire it's like what every empire does you've got to put this grand story behind you in order to legitimize your rule right and that's literally played all the way into sharia with the way that muslims treat kafirs and polythe and non-believers Yep. So, okay, I'm just going to, by the way, I'm just bringing this up since we just mentioned that, but for those who want, this is a little bit of a whitewashing of Islam, but it's so very interesting from, for those Muslims who say, but Islam didn't do any conquests. Well, this, this helpful Muslim scholar compiled this very interesting atlas of the Islamic conquest with descriptions of the wars and the places and how the armies fought. And yeah, it covers a whole historical, <laughs> It's oh, a whole historic I have to see. Oh, the whole history, the whole proud history of Islamic military conquest. You know, so it talks about all of the Islamic conquests, and you can read it and motivate yourself and your kids to study it because it's all about how we conquered the world, how we killed everybody. And they have a bunch but of wars you can see in this list. Led by the sword, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, according to this, it was, according to this <laughs> exactly. uh right. So now Okay, so I'll run through a couple of sections relatively quickly. But so Islam teaches that Abraham, right, the father, the father of Judaism, right, the father of the the Jews of the nation of uh, the Hebrews. I don't know if it gives a death toll, Harris. I actually I don't. I haven't checked that deeply. But um, yeah, no one's ever really done a proper study of that. But yeah, um, although we can statistically work out from another source called the Encyclopedia of Wars. What? The, there's a there's a very interesting book called the Encyclopedia of Wars that details the wars that have been fought. Not every single war, but but a significant number. And also certain battles are so in one war, for instance, there were 250 battles. So they've just lumped these 250 battles into one war. So it's not one war as opposed to 250 wars, right? Even though it happened over a number of decades. Um, but you can look at that. So statistically speaking, um you'll find that Islam is responsible for more violence and warfare than all other religions on earth combined. Yeah, that, I mean, Lloyd, I, I want to be shocked by that statement, but yeah. I'm not. 
I'm absolutely. No, I can show that another time. But yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it's, yeah. It's... I would love to deep dive into that because um, just even as an ex-Muslim, so somebody who once revered Muhammad, I don't even want to say prophet anymore, but like for somebody who once revered Muhammad, um, to know that whatever cult was created either by him or in his name or the Abbasids later on or whatever theory you want to jump on, that the, just the, the amount of people that have a lost their lives are suffering or have died believing in this absolute crap. If we could ever put a number on it, I mean, boy, would it be sad, but I mean, it would be very, very telling. So yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. happy to delve into that at some point later. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, we could actually, I mean, the, the Encyclopedia of Wars, I can have a look through that. It might actually have some, because that's the best study we have on that topic. So yeah. now, according to the Quran 60 verse 4, you have a fair example in Abraham and the ones with him, as they said to their people, we are quit of you. In other words, they founded this new religion and they left everyone else behind and said, you don't want to believe what we believe. We're done with you, right? We disbelieve in you and between you and us, right? So Abraham said to everyone else, between you and us, enmity, which translates in the dictionary as hostility, hatred, ill will, animosity, and antagonism. That's a pretty nasty word has appeared. Yeah, very much right? so. And abhorrence which is yeah. extreme repugnance, loathing, abomination, disgust. I mean, if you thought forever. hate was bad, look, look at that. <laughs> yeah, right. Hate was and a strong word, but... Yeah. yeah, so we will hate you. We will we will see you as abominable you, and repugnant. Extremely, yeah, exactly. Forever you will... until, you've been, until you believe in Allah alone, right? So this yeah. is their claim to Abraham. Right, so now let's go to the doctrine of al-wala wal-bara. Right, this doctrine of al-wala wal-bara, disassociation and enmity, loyalty and disavowal in Islam, which is one of the one of the doctrines that Islam teaches, which separates them from non-Muslims. Right, so you have to know that after loving Allah and His Messenger, Allah obligates us to hate those who oppose Allah and His Messenger. There is no love in Islam, and this is a God who hates. Because also, can we just focus yeah. on the juxtaposition of sure. the word obligates us to love and hate? those who oppose that juxtaposition this is meant to be divinely inspired stuff yeah and you're obligated divinely to hate which almost seems, seems inherently contradictory to the concept of divinity and love it, well it's a god who teaches hatred yeah. yeah exactly this is why so many actual believing quote-unquote muslims are better than islam because they don't know what they're obligated to do. Yeah. So they must hate the people of shirk, which is, this would be technically Christians who associate God with Allah, yeah. right? Who associate partners with Allah, basically. And this obligation comes from the creed of Abraham, the creed we are ordered to follow. So this is a complete denial and a complete retelling of the Abrahamic story from the Bible. They've just said, well, actually, Abraham never said that. Abraham said the following, hate everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, this is so this is the doctrine, one of the doctrines that that Islam so teaches. The beautiful yep. doctrine of the religion of peace literally starts off with the first man who was created yep. and almost taught hatred. Like, yep. and Abraham founded the yeah. the tribe of Judah. Well, a Abraham founded the, the Israeli nation, and apparently Abraham hated them. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great thing. You know, you know how they say, start as you mean to go on. Well, this is a great start. <laughs> yeah. So let's continue. So now let's have a look at this. Right. Now we're talking about al wala wal bara, this this doctrine of hating and loving, loving your own and hating anyone else outside of yeah. your group, right? The other, let's say. Yeah. They speak of those who died. Now, this is the Encyclopedia of Islam, those who died after spending their lives waging war against their appetite of soul basically fighting against your your lower self right your right. your appetites your your greed lusts all of these bad emotions right and so on so these people who waged war and died after spending their lives waging war against the appetite of soul were regarded as martyrs mm -hmm. so now martyr is not just a jihadi who kills and he's killed but someone who apparently now fights to hate others right we'll see here even if he dies in his own bed he is a shahid who will be treated as if he had been killed fighting alongside the prophet. Wow. Other, other imami traditions declare as martyrs those who are in their lifetime practiced muddarat, who 
In other words, those who treated others in a friendly manner while concealing their true attitude <laughs> towards them. I'm sorry, Islam is hilarious. It's basically praising people who are lying and deceiving you to your face, yes. inwardly hating you, smiling outwardly at you. I, Lloyd, it's like, imagine if we worked together and I would hate you literally from the depths of my heart, but every single day I'd be like, morning Lloyd, how are you? Yeah, I yeah. literally act like I freaking care about you. That's what Islam teaches and is praising the person that acts like me for the rest of my life. I'm up there with the Shaheed, people who died for either their country, if it's a Muslim one, or Islam, or in jihad for Muhammad, when the guy himself is asking people to like give him their armor because he's too scared to fight, but we yep. won't go into that. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is Islam. This is, I mean, you can go into the tafsir, but the thing is, I'm trying not to use those standard sources, but yeah. this is corroborated in other sources. I'm just going into the Islamic law. Here's a common Bedouin saying, right? I'm against my brother. My brother and I are against my cousin, and my cousin and I are against the stranger. Also quoted as, I and my brother are against my cousin. I and my cousin are against the stranger. This is Arab pagan desert dwelling thinking which has become effectively Islamic law. Wow, that right. is mental. Yeah. So you've got a hierarchy of loyalties based exactly. on how that's close you are to people. Hierarchy. Sorry? Exactly. Sorry, that's what the first two quotes gave away. Like you yeah. can you can screw somebody over, but when, it, when push comes to shove, it's the hierarchy of loyalties that kicks in and you'll always be against the other. Even if you've been yeah. against your own kin or your own blood before that, so this clearly, this law clearly is derived from a Bedouin source, from a pagan Arab desert dweller source. It's not taken from any other understanding. So they've taken these cultural aspects as well. And actually, there's something else I'll talk about in the future. But you know when people say, oh, that's not Islamic, that's cultural. Okay. They'll, they'll often say that's not Islamic, that's cultural. Actually, let me find something. I am not going to find it in time, but there are certain things called... Okay, hold on. Let me find this. And oh yeah, so just as you do that, I'll just read the super chat. Oh, Norse mythology seven. Okay, here we go. I'm going to put this here. Okay, oh. Yeah, can you hear? Yeah, very badly, very weakly. So these are the five normative maxims of Islamic law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I want you to see this here. Cultural usage shall have the weight of law. Mm -hmm. So you're a lawyer, right? So when Muslims tell you, no, that wasn't Islamic, that was cultural. Yeah. Well, the problem is if it's cultural, it is the law. Yeah. Especially, why does it have the weight of the law then? <laughs> Understand? This is one of the maxims. Now, now you can say this is Wikipedia. Oh my God, Lloyd's using Wikipedia. Sorry? This is actually, again, you brought up a brilliant point because I always get stuck when I'm trying to sometimes talk about Islam and culture and people always say what you're saying, that you know you can't, that's not Islamic, that's cultural. At, in some points and in certain um, pockets of history and certain populaces, these two things are so intertwined and it's because of this. It's because basically the cultural, like whatever the cultural um, like propagation is, is actually equal to the law. It becomes so, the law. Yeah, exactly. And if you've given it the same weightage as the law, then there is no differentiation. And then yeah. it becomes very hard to think whether something is um, obligated or something is just a cultural thing. And those lines get blurred, and then you've got Islamic societies just suffering because that's when F FGM and things like that can ensue. And you, the, the lines are very blurred. Is this culture? Is this religion? What is this? And well, they'll say, no, it's cultural. Well, the problem is, if it is part of Islamic culture, then it is the law. Touche. Exactly. Islamic so culture this... is a thing which people need to understand. Yeah. Now they can say, oh, no, it's in Wikipedia and Wikipedia is wrong because, yeah. oh, well, the problem is you can go to any number of Islamic texts that will corroborate this. Any number of Islamic law texts that will corroborate the same thing. There's a whole, there's a list over here and you can go find others. Understand? So, 
Yep. So now notice it says within the Islamic Sharia that the Muslim is the brother of the Muslim. This corroborates again what we've just been speaking about. He does not oppress him. He does not hang back from coming to his aid or belittle him. It is sufficiently wicked for someone to demean his fellow Muslim and then they turn on that person. So this is within the law. Yeah. It's right. so, um, yeah. Is I, I just feel like the more I learn and read about Islam and obviously the concept of the Ummah derives from like this concept of a collective brotherhood of Muslims, for example, and the role of the women in this is to obviously procreate and create these amazing Muslim jihadi soldiers who are going to go out and obviously not stop until the world is like, you know, mm -hmm. just entirely Islamic and the Khalifate is like, you know, resurrected. Um, but you see more and more in all of their texts, there's such a like a an inherent thing about kind of this in grouping and this us tribalism. versus them. Exactly. Yeah. It is very, very much us versus them. To the point where there's obviously specific hadiths where Muhammad is trying to actually inverse, as you rightly mentioned earlier, actually inverse like things that the Jews would do to kind of differentiate himself because it very much became a us versus them tribalistic yeah. thing and we we need to be different and we need to express ourselves in this ways and you know that's where you get a lot of these kind of islamic prescriptions and even how circumcisions come about in history it's very tribalistic in its in its expression right yep so we'll go a couple more slides and finish this chapter and then um yes well, so, i realize we are over the hour mark so whatever you yeah, want to so that. so islam has two purposes right and there are two critical Quran verses. Now, I don't refer to the Quran very often. It's not really relevant, to be honest, but to the, the Sharia can do without it. But yeah. w when the Sharia refers to the Quran, then it's relevant. When the Sharia refers to a Hadith, then it's relevant. Right. Right. So in Quran 4157, Islam has a religious purpose. So they claim that they killed Jesus not, nor crucified him. Of a surety, they killed him not. So Islam rejects and it seeks to correct the gospel. Right. It seeks to correct the idea of the crucifixion, the death and resurrection of Jesus, and it wants to replace Jesus with Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Then there is a political purpose called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Let there arise out of you a group of people inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. Enjoining is a legal term. right? Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is the fundamental doctrine of Islam. It guides the Ummah's socio-political behavior and their agenda. And if you're not a Muslim, Sharia is binding upon non-Muslims too. True, and the truth, that's extremely problematic. Yeah. Now, Christianity has its, its fundamental doctrine as well, called the Great Commission, which is go forth into the world and spread the gospel. Mm. Right. Islam, let, let's have a look at commanding the right and forbidding the wrong in Islam. Let's actually have a look at that. That will be interesting. And we'll, we've discussed this in the past, but yeah. so here we've got, so within the Reliance of the Traveler, this, this book discusses a lot of things, prayer, purification, zakat, fasting, pilgrimage, trade, inheritance, marriage, divorce. Yeah. Now people say, well, you know, the Sharia isn't relevant for today anymore. It was relevant, oh, a thousand years ago. No one does it anymore. Well, okay, so no Muslims get married. No Muslims get divorced. Nobody fasts. No one goes on pilgrimage. So, so in other words, this stuff, no one prays. That's all irrelevant. No one does that. Sharia doesn't. Yeah. Of course, Muslims don't do that stuff, you know. Yeah. So, but let's have a look. Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Okay, fascinating. Let's let's go have a look at commanding the right, the Great Commission of Islam. Right, their fundamental doctrine, their most important purpose. Yeah. The reason that they exist. <laughs> yeah. Right. I was waiting for that. For some reason, it's a tad slow. There we go. Book Q: Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Right. So, what Muslims have to do to to make sure that Islam is not spread into the world. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's see the obligation. It's a legal obligation. This is wajib. It's a legal term. These words yeah. are not casually placed here. They're, they're very specific wajib. This is the obligation. It's a legal command. It's a, it's a holy command from Allah and it's communal. The whole community must do this. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look. You can read this for me to see what the steps they must take to make sure that Islam becomes a dominant force in the world. Just read those for me, please. Sure. So you explain that, explaining that something is wrong, forbidding the act verbally, censoring with harsh words, writing the wrong by hand, intimidation, assault, force of arms, lastly. <laughs> yeah. 
It's the holy use of assault. It's holy assault. It's the holy use in the, obviously, yeah, the divine fight for <laughs> jihad. But Lloyd, um, I remember a previous discussion on this where you mentioned that actually some of these steps could be skipped. Yes. No, you can go straight from here, straight to there. Yeah. You don't have to. This is a recommended list. <laughs> it's not a compulsory list. Right. Again, there's this just religion of peace at play there. You don't even have to follow protocol. That's just recommended. But if you think it's yeah. severe enough, you can go straight to writing the wrong by hand. You know, forget censoring with harsh words. Yeah. This of is Sharia mandated. Yeah. So in Chantris, I mean, that, that's all nice statements. So forceful conversion, all this violence is a characteristic of the Abrahamic faiths. Islam is not an Abrahamic faith. It claims to be. And that claim, as we discussed previously, was only made when the Jews rejected Muhammad. That claim was never part of Muhammad's writings, never part of the literature, until the Jews told him, get lost. And then he turned around and said, oh, by the way, I come from the line of Abraham. And then he made, his, made up his whole story. Through Ishmael. And, um, claim correct. Ishmael but also, Ishmael. if it's going to be part of, it needs to be doctrinal. Now, look, someone could be doing something, then he's violating doctrine. Now, if you look at the written doctrine, look at the doctrine. What does the doctrine say? What does the written set of rules that they follow say? If the rules don't say that, then they are violating doctrine. Violations of doctrine are not examples of doctrine. Those are violations. Islam is following doctrine. Now, if you're going to claim that, yes, these Christians converted by the sword, then they were breaking doctrine. They were violating doctrine. You would have to bring me doctrine that states written rules, like I can show you in the Sharia, that gives me a list of rules. Here's the 10 steps you use. Pull out your sword, chop off the head. Give me those rules from the New Testament. Show me that list of rules. Bring me that actual list. From the words of Jesus, preferably. Just bring me the list. Bring me the book that he wrote that says, this is how you kill people. This is how you chop off hands. If you're going to make the claim, bring me the doctrine. I'd love to see it. You can't do it. So, yeah. Um, so moving on from here. So I will, excuse my annoyance, please. But uh, just sometimes I see things that uh, just, okay. I'm not going to, I'm going to skip over this. Now, finally, I'll end here with this. This yeah. is called the Akida. This is called, now within Christian belief, you have the Nicene Creed. And yes, the conspiracy theorists are suddenly going to go wild about the Nicene Creed. Mm. It was written by gray aliens <laughs> as part of the Bigfoot Illuminati Alliance and Conspiracy. Yes. In 1421, it was then redacted <laughs> using the Scaligeri calendaring system, which I'm was sorry, then... Which you're I, killing me. I, I'm sorry, but, but seriously, <laughs> man. You know, and then, you know, and it was written by Francis Bacon, whose pen name was, <laughs> was, was Shakespeare. So, okay, so moving on. Who was actually right. an Arab called Shakespeare? <laughs> Jokes. <laughs> and he gave birth to the queen who is a Muslim. Oh yeah, or Queen of Sheba. <laughs> exactly. So so now moving on from that point. Yeah. So you've got the Nicene Creed, right? Mm -hmm. Which is fundamental to Christian belief. It's the set of beliefs. It's an orthodox set of beliefs for Christian belief, right? Okay. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, and so on. Okay. I mean, so this is a fundamental set of beliefs. It's a basic set of beliefs that that that, that describes Christian orthodoxy, and then everything else flows from that from that set of beliefs. The doctrine flows from it. So you have verses, verses that are using exegesis. You get to these rules, and these rules are then written down, and then from there you get doctrine that's written down. All right. Right. Now, the Akida mm. is the Islamic equivalent to this Nicene Creed. Okay. Right? There are many different Akidas. They're all very similar. There, there are three different schools or four different schools, or maybe there's a dozen. I don't know. It depends who yeah, you ask. But the, questions the, ask you, like, what Akida? <laughs> the Creed. Yes. Yeah, yeah the creed. Well, creed. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's... Exactly. So there's like three different of these schools and they and within each school, there's like multiple different Akidas as well, different creeds. So it's all roughly the much of a muchness, right? So mm -hmm. let's not get hung up on that. The Akida refers to those matters of faith which are believed in with certainty and conviction in one's heart and soul. They are not tainted with doubt or uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Right? Don't think, yeah. just here's the rules, shut up. Right? Mm -hmm. Think Next. it with all your heart. Yeah. yeah. Next. Now, like the Nicene Creed, it establishes orthodox beliefs and refutes deviations. It is the foundation of the, of the faith, right? It consists of matters which are known from the Quran and sound ahadith, and which mm -hmm. Muslims must believe, notice, in his heart. Yeah. This is actually, it's a technical loophole because you don't have to speak it. It's in your heart. It's not logos. Logos is the spoken word. This is, this opens the door for takia. Understand? Mm -hmm. To use that phrase that people like, I don't like the word because it's 
it's a minor part of Islam. The correct term is hiyal, right? Mm. But, and this is an acknowledgement of the truth of Allah and his messenger, right? Mm. And popular I statements... Jump in yeah. right there real quick. I mean, on the flip side, somebody like me, when I was a, a, like a lay Muslim and I wasn't privy to this information, um, it's it also trickles down in, in like smaller Muslim circles. If you don't delve into Islam and you are generally like a good and accepting slash like pluralistic person who wants to like you know fully kind of assimilate into the society that you're in a lot of the times if you're doing things which by other muslim standards are considered un-islamic you do kind of lend like i really heavily lent on this that like oh it's in my heart like my faith in allah is in my heart and like whatever i do is between me and allah it's not anyone else's business so yeah that is actually within the law yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. and i think obviously that bit just trickles down to us lay muslims but this is this is that in a lot of a deeper sense. Yeah, because yeah, the, actually we need to get into the doctrine of lying to actually cover what you've just mentioned. It's the right. detail of the doctrine of lying. But so notice there are popular statements of basic Sunni Islamic doctrine, articles of faith. You get the Akida al Tahawiya, right? So look, there's the Ashari and Maturidi schools, and then the Akida yeah. al Tahawiya is part of the um, uh, the school of the. It's mainly followed by the Salafs, the Salafis. Okay. Right. So there's three different schools. Look, I mean, so this is just one of them. And within the same school, there's a couple of them. There's a couple of, mm -hmm. so there's Ashari, Maturidi, and there's one other. And this is, and this is one of the Akidas within one of the schools. And there's like a couple of them. So it's not a big deal. But yeah. Akida is a primary science in Islam. It's an important science. And I'll finish with this section and I will take only three. We'll just have a look at a couple. Mm -hmm. So if you go into the Akida, it's like 100, 120, 140, whatever rules you follow. Right. Let's go look at 73. Okay, we follow the Sunnah of the Prophet and the congregation of the Muslims. We avoid deviation, differences, and divisions. So what? So therefore, they must follow the ijma, the consensus. Yeah. And this is critical within Islam. That ijma is the main source yeah. of authority. Ijma Notice is again. Sure. Yeah. And again, to go along with the doctrine of al wala wal bara, we love the people of justice and trustworthiness, i.e., the Muslims, and we hate the people of injustice and treachery. That's you, you if you're not a Muslim. <laughs> Yes, all of us, we are right. screwed. Yeah. So they are taught within their, within their doctrine, they're taught within their law, and they're taught within their creed to hate non-Muslims. Now, obviously, different Muslims are closer or further away from these things, but this is in the doctrine, whether you know it or not. Yeah. Right. This is the written doctrine. This is the core formal doctrine. And number 75, when our knowledge about something is unclear, we say, <laughs> Allah knows best. Oh, oh my God. No, that's hilarious. That is so funny. Do you know how many times we have heard that? When actual questioning Muslims ask these, like, what, I mean, they seem very, very obvious questions, but, like, the scholars can't answer them when they say Allah knows best. I mean, everything to do with the afterlife and the soul is already Allah knows best. But every question that you have as a human being, as a believing Muslim, that is contradicted to Islam or kind of puts Islam um, in danger if you start asking about, I don't know, anything, whether it's like the age of Aisha when she got married or dinosaurs or why Muhammad's dad was called Abdullah if, why is the word Allah lurking around before Islam? They literally answer with Allah knows best. That, for me, that number 75 provision, when our knowledge about something is unclear, we say Allah knows best. That is basically a cop out. That's saying we don't know. We're gonna lump our God in there and say He knows why that's the way it is, but we don't. All we're saying is that you've got to hate the people yep. that don't believe in Allah and love the ones that do. And anything we don't understand, Allah knows best. This is a recipe for disaster. This is a recipe for mentally disabling anyone who's following yep. you and and causing nothing but hatred and like. Honestly, like megalomania type vibes in, in, in the way your personality will be, would be built if you read texts like this and try and kind of fashion your personality and your creed and your steadfastness and your piety based on principles such as hate the people of injustice and treachery. Okay, because injustice and treachery according to who? According to my Allah. And mm -hmm. therefore, that's very dangerous. Right. Yeah. So interesting, and Chantra says that I'm I'm presenting facts mixed with Christian propaganda. Now, when I state that Christianity has a Nicene Creed, I believe that's called a fact. 
Okay, but yeah. when, when I say the first few lines from it, that, that is a fact. That is a factual. You can check that. That is not propaganda. I'm not here teaching. You can learn theology without, without being an evangelist. I'm not an evangelist. This is not what I do. I am presenting facts taken from doctrine, taken from written doctrine, and I am showing the doctrine. So, so fascinating. We're here to talk about Sharia. I'm not certain what some other people are here to talk about. So, yeah. No, so, understand. Is, saying Allah knows best. Story. We'll finish here. Yeah. So, Allah knows best is something Muslims are actually ordered to do within mm. their creed. Mm. Because there are things that the scholars don't know. There are things they don't want them to know. So, they are, so they are ordered from, the, from an early age to say, Allah knows best. Don't st stop thinking right here. Turn off your brain. And we'll yeah. pause here. Yeah. No, that, I'll that's stop great. sharing. Thank you so much, Thanks, Lloyd. Steve. That's um, extremely informative. And uh, yeah, again, I just always feel like I'm kind of like having to um, monitor the chat a bit more or just kind of see what's going on. I think, I don't know why, people get very, 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 and I hate to use this word because I always hear people using it. And I vowed that I'd never use it, but I think it's very, like, just, it's very apt at the minute. Like, I feel like people are very butthurt seeing somebody like myself who's like a secular humanist agnostic atheist whatever you want to call me teaming up with somebody who is openly a christian and we both we both have a topic in common that we want to talk about i feel like no matter what however tunnel vision we go in our approach to tackle a topic it's always going to either somehow hit at your background or hit at my views and that's going to be a point of contention in the comments and somebody actually emailed me before this stream saying that they were a Christian and that they had been blocked um, and they were looking forward to this stream so to unblock them. And I apologize and I unblocked them. And I said, obviously, like this is a channel where complete like freedom of expression and thought and, you know, like, everything is allowed. So I'm not going to go around blocking people because they, they believe in something. This whole chat is it is a room for that kind of discussion. It's only when it gets like nasty or it turns into like insults or whatever that you know we have to kind of just cut it but um yeah I, I honestly I think I think AP's kind of experienced similar things when he kind of initially was teaming up with David Wood I just don't think people can comprehend the fact that somebody who believes in a god and somebody who doesn't believe in a god can actually get along and have a productive conversation without a god or lack of god thereof getting in the way do you know what I mean yeah. they're so used to like this hostility that you know I have to call you out every second or you have to call me out every second I don't know. Yeah, unfortunately, Jawad White's a Muslim and a very dishonest one at that. And I think he's gay and I think he likes me because he keeps following me around. Poor guy. He's okay. always trying to, you know, chat me up. <laughs> Jawad, sorry, buddy. Sorry, buddy. I don't swing that way. <laughs> um, so, look, I mean, honestly, I spent 11 years in the Middle East. I spent a lot of that time going to some very bad places where my job was to make sure that no more bombings went on, no more people got killed, no more blood was shed. I see Islam from that perspective. I don't come at it from, from, do you have a moment to speak about Jesus? No. My job was to make sure that people didn't die. Islam is violent. I've been to these places. I've seen the dysfunction. I've seen the poverty. Man, I was in Lebanon and the refugees, oh my God. When, when you see these refugees coming into Europe with their Ray-Bans, their Nikes, their Nike Airs, shoes that I can't afford. When they come in with their little Rolexes and their, you know, their, their, their very smart cell phones, you're like, I have seen the refugees in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon. Those people were dressed in rags. They were sleeping covered in plastic. You know, the, the people have no idea the dysfunction that Islam causes and the violence. And, and this is my concern. This is my real concern. And um, I was a bodyguard. People paid me to make sure other people didn't kill them. So mm -hmm. understand, I'm not here. So I'm not the, turn. look, yes, I will turn the other cheek so you can kiss me on that one too. <laughs> but understand, um, right, my job was to deal with these issues, to deal with violence and stop violence. So I'm not coming at this from an evangelical perspective. I come at this from technically a military perspective. I was never in the military, but I worked oh, alongside very closely. Mm. So this is my concern. Islam is a violent totalitarian political system. It needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's what I want to actually, I, well, I just want to shout out to Nuri. Thank you so much. Um, she's saying the knowledge and depth that Lloyd has and shares is very informative and I appreciate his views very much. Um, thank you, Nuri. And I think you've also sent a super chat earlier as well. So thank you so much for that. Oh, yeah, you said love these streams. I always catch up later. 
as I have a busy schedule lately. Keep it up, guys. Love to all listening. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you so much, Nori, for the support. Oh, Shaquille Zaman also said, Islam should only be taught like Greek mythology. Oh, my God, yes. Islam should only be taught like Greek mythology in schools. Amen to that, Shaquille. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. And Norse, thank you so much. You were a regular, always supporting this channel. I'm happy you made it to the live today. So congrats. Thank you for being here. Um, but yeah, Lloyd, exactly. I, I completely agree with you. And um, I mean, someone made a very, someone actually made a comment. Where was it? Which is exactly what I wanted to reiterate. But it was the point about um, this political Islam and this political Islam that you understand and that you're actually fighting Respect to Lloyd from an atheist. Garfiers unite us against Sharia. You know what? I, I, I think I need to make a little bit of a statement on um, on, on, on like uh, us collaborating. I know a lot of people are getting like more and more hurt and they're causing reasons to have controversy. And I just want to say to people, like, to be honest, um, my channel, and I have to say this over and over and again, and quite frankly, I'm getting tired of repeating myself, but... If you're going to like have the same contentions, well, I'll repeat myself one last time, but honestly, that's about it. This channel is about exposing Islam for what it is. If somebody has an in-depth study of Islam or a lived experience or a real experience, and you've got sources that claim to be Islamic, I don't give a crap. And I'm going to say this on YouTube today because I'm done. I don't give a crap if one sect or two sects or three sects of Islam don't care for that text. If one sect or 20 people in a village that consider themselves to be Muslim care for that text, for me, that's under the umbrella of Islam. And if that's a nuisance, I will show it. I will talk about it. I will ridicule it. I will mock it. I will discuss it for the abhorrent human rights violation that it is. And I don't care how many people follow it or not. I don't care if you believe in it. I don't care where it fits in your hierarchy. If Muslim, if Muslim scholars, if Al Azhar University is giving it the green light, I sure as hell will give it the green light. I'm not here to sift through your Muslim sources and think what is most popularized and what's more, most fallen in what country. I only come from a certain background of Sunni Islam in a Pakistani background. I wasn't even told which sect within a sect within a sect within a sect I come from. All I know is it's a background of Sunni Islam. I don't know beyond that. But what I see at face value, I will call it out. I will say it's wrong. I will say it's detrimental to women, to humankind, to children, to animals, to everyone. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'm just tired of mine and Lloyd's dreams getting absolutely derailed by people saying, oh, Christian that, Christian whatever. Uh, that's fine. Lloyd is not here preaching. He is not at any point stopped and gone off onto a rant on Christianity. He has like the literal respect to come onto an atheist channel and have this common goal in mind where we're just talking about Sharia. So you guys can have like this, this, the space is open. Talk about what you want. This is a platform for learning. Discuss Christianity, discuss irrationalism, discuss thought. I don't give a crap. Do it in the chats. But please don't have these personal attacks derailing people. Lloyd can have his worldview and I can have my worldview and we can happily have a cup of coffee together. It's not the Muslim thing where it's, it's them and the other and there's all hatred. It doesn't work like that. Um, so yeah, that, that's all I wanted to say. Sorry, Lloyd, I know it took some time, but I just wanted to wrap this up because quite frankly, I'm sick of this. This is my platform. I can platform whoever the hell I like. If you don't like it, stop watching. Honestly, stop sending me emails telling me to watch out for this and that. If someone is proselytizing on my channel, I know it. And I, me, Lloyd and I have established a professional relationship and that's not what's happening here. We are unraveling Sharia and quite frankly, I think you're scared. You're scared of the knowledge that Lloyd has. You're scared of how accessible the sources are. There's nothing hidden. And, and I'm just showing it. I don't care whether it's Shia or a Sunni source. I was a Muslim once. The only thing I can turn to is the sources that I know and I read to leave the cult. So whatever Lloyd has, it, it, he's even teaching me things I didn't know before. And I hope that by putting this out there, you can all learn with me and we can all learn together. And we can have these productive conversations discussing God and the philosophies behind it. By all means, that's why I don't want to block people. I don't want to block you if you're Christian, if you're Jain, if you're Hindu. You're more than welcome on this platform. It's just that my my view is that I'm a secular humanist. That does not mean I'm not going to host other people of varying beliefs. This channel goes whichever trajectory I want to take it in because it's my platform. So you can be here and enjoy it, but I really don't appreciate 
all these emails telling me who to talk to and who not to talk to. And we are knee deep in the middle of a series and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'm learning as we did in the last one. And I'm grateful to Lloyd for being here. So I apologize, Lloyd, for yeah, <laughs> that last yeah. part, Someone said I'm, Brother Ben said I'm bigoted to Muslims. I don't talk about Muslims. I talk about Islam. I discuss the Sharia. Now, certain Muslims are certainly applying these ideas. Right. So this is not me attacking Muslims. This is me saying this is what's in the doctrine. And this has to be dealt with because this is the law for eternity, for all time. So yeah. Islam is a political. It, Islam, in its own sources, claims to be a deen. And a deen is a totalitarian political ideology, which we'll cover, which we have covered in the past. Thanks, Thanks Nuria. Yeah, so we can we can end. But thank you. That's, again, enlightening. And uh, yeah. and we'll continue next week if uh, if you have the time. Yeah, no, for sure. Let's do that. Um, thank you so much. Sorry for the rant, people. I just, it's just, I'm really tired. I mean, I really look forward to these streams and I get so many reasons to be demotivated before it. And that's just not on. If you don't like it, start your own channel and have your own discussions. This is what I, I'm doing and I'm going to continue to do it. So like, love it or loathe it. It's not my problem. Um, but yeah, sorry. Uh, Lloyd, thank you so much. Let's do this again very soon, obviously. Thank you thank to you. everyone for being here. Um, yeah, thank you to all the regulars. I see you all in the chat. Much love. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up with Lloyd, so I can't keep up with the chat. But yeah, um, we'll let Lloyd go. It's very late where he is. And good night, guys. Everybody have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Sunday. Bye, Lloyd. Take care. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.